Yes, sir. So I'm Paul Mazurkowitz. I'm a distinguished technologist and a material strategist for the Workstations and Thin Clients uh, R&D group. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how to make the best sushi in Tokyo. Really, I'm going to be talking about workstation quality and reliability, but I, I thought I'd start out with a little bit of a story um, about a movie I saw recently called uh, Hero Dreams of Sushi. Some of you may have seen it on Netflix. Um, it's about Hiro Ono, and he's a... Uh, He's a sushi chef that's been making sushi for 70 years. That's almost as long as HP has been making electronic products. And uh, one of the interesting things that caught me when I was watching the movie was how similar his, his art and science is to how we actually develop workstation products. And that's a really important point, right? To get some really good at something, it's not just the science of doing it, it's also the art as well. And so he's been perfecting his craft by doing it over and over and over for the last 70 years. Very similar to how we've been doing the same thing with workstations for, you know, HP's been making electronics, like, like I said, for 75 years, and workstations for 30 plus. And we've been doing the same thing. I mean, you can take parts and put them into a box, and you can call it a workstation, but it's really not a workstation. It's that ability to put it together and really understand what you're doing at a very detailed level that, it, that really sets us apart. So to really understand what I'm talking about here, um, I've got a chart up here that's basically the uh, uh, holistic view of workstation design. I mean, at the very top, we have performance, right? Now, you've heard from, from our customers, you know, from, uh, from Stan, Sam and Steven both. They talk about how performance is a no-compromise situation, right? We, we have to have maximum performance at all times under any condition. And that's, you know, forefront in our minds in R&D. We're always keeping that in mind. But you, you can't have the infinite performance, right? We can't turn the processors up to 20 or 30 gigahertz because the problem is, is they get hot, right? So that we have to deal with thermals when we're designing a system as well. And of course, you can't have fans running at, you know, 10,000 RPM in the box because then you have acoustic problems. And so you can see here in the, in the diagram that I've got up there that we really need to balance all of these things. But you know what's really important, it's one of the most important things we think about, is right in the middle. It's the systems have to be designed for reliability. So, so what does that mean? Well, it starts out, number one, as a culture of excellence. And when Jim was talking earlier, he was talking about quality and reliability and how he pushes that through the whole organization. And that's the truth. We hear from Jim all the time, every time he speaks to, to all of us in R&D, about how quality and reliability should be at the top of our minds. This is true throughout the entire management chain and all of the engineers in Workstations R&D are thinking about it in every single design, design decision that we actually make. Um, you know, it's great to have that in your mind, right, and be thinking about it, but you really have to standardize what you're doing as well. And so we have some very rigorous design standards that are not only based on industry standards, but on our own learnings. And again, to go back to my earlier story, this is really the art of making a workstation. Um, a lot of these design standards have been developed by HP uh, literally over decades and are unique to, um, to our processes and our designs. And then lastly, you actually have to test your products. You have to actually put them through their paces and make sure that they, they really can do what we say that they do. And that's why you know, all of our systems go through at least 95,000 hours of testing, some more, um, to make sure that everything is working exactly the way that it should be. Um, so let's talk about those, those three aspects that I showed you earlier in the, uh, in the holistic design chart. Again, uh, we've talked a lot about performance today. Uh, things like using Xeon and core processors, uh, NVIDIA graphics, AMD graphics, Thunderbolt 3 connectivity, um, the whole Z Turbo Drive series, which is pure performance, right? And then, of course, the Z coolers and efficient design. Um, these are all important in making, you know, a product line that's got, you know, four different notebook products, uh, five different desktop products, and the industry-only all-in-one workstation. This is something we talked about a little bit earlier as well, and this is a really important thing when you're, when you're in R&D. You've got to be thinking about this all the time. And that's that as heat increases, your performance and reliability goes down. You know, now, why is that? Well, you know, there's a scientist. His name was Arrhenius. Um, some of you may have heard of him. And uh, he studied this, right? And he came up with, a, with an equation um, that bears his name today. And it basically says, as you heat things up, things go faster, right? And the things that go faster are things like aging and breakdown and so on. So this is, this is a, a physical law, right? And it's something that we have to deal with 
whenever we're designing a system. So we spend a lot of time working on the, the thermals of a system. And then of course, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you really have to be careful about how you actually deal with the thermals. You can't just crank the fans up to 10,000 RPM. And so what I've, I've uh, brought here, just to kind of illustrate uh, what we do around the acoustics, is a chart here, and this is from our own internal HP R&D testing. And what it is, is it's a measurement of the Z840 system uh, in, uh, relative to our competition, to our two biggest competitors in the workstation space. And you can see here um, that at the lowest loads, that's the bottom of these charts right here, at the lowest loads, we're all a little bit below 25 decibels. And so, so how loud is that for those of you that aren't familiar with the decibel chart? Well, that's the sound of basically a small watch ticking on your arm in a completely silent room. Very, very difficult for a lot of people to actually even hear. So, uh, so you can see everybody when you're not actually doing anything is, uh, is right down in that level. But then as we go up and we ramp the systems to maximum performance levels, this is when we really crank the systems up. You can see that the 840 is at about 33 decibels, right? And that's about as loud as two people whispering maybe a cubicle away from you. So you can't really tell what they're talking about, but you know, you know somebody's there maybe. Um, but then you look at our competition and the next closest is above 40 decibels. That's as loud as two people having a conversation in that pod at full volume. You can, you can definitely hear what they're talking about. And then one of our competitors was close to 50 decibels. This is as loud as two people actually sitting right next to you having a full volume conversation. And that's really gonna distract from your workflow when you're you know, trying to uh, design a movie or working on a video and you're really in the zone and trying to be creative and you've got something that loud sitting right next to you. So it just shows you, you know, how much effort we actually put in to making these systems as quiet as possible. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little story here, but uh, before I do that, um, I wanna talk about how we balance these things. You know, we keep saying we have the best performance in the industry, we've got the quietest systems, right? We really manage our thermals, but, but how do we balance all these things? And it's really about handling the air, right? So we cool these systems with air coming in the front end. And let's see, let me show you something real quick here. So you can see here, I've got a picture of our Z840 system, and then I've got a picture of our uh, competitor system as well. And uh, we have a customer, a uh, really big software company in Cupertino. Um, they make uh, things like maps and search engines and such. And uh, they came to us and said, you know, we were looking at your 840 system, and we were looking at one of your competitors' systems, you know, equally configured and everything, and we noticed something really interesting. The, uh, the, the, it's a dual, dual processor system, and we noticed that their processors aren't running at the same speed. One of them's actually running slower than the other, but in your system, they're both running at full speed. Like, like what's going on, HP? So we went and got a sample of both boxes and, and looked at them and discovered something really interesting. On our competitor's design, you can see here that they've got one CPU, the air's coming in the front end of the system, and they're actually preheating the air that blows on the second CPU. Not a good thing. What happens is, is this one either gets too hot or you have to run this one a little bit slower to keep that one from overheating. But you can see in our design here, we've actually offset the two and use a patented air guide technology, which I have right here, to supply fresh air to both of the CPUs so that they can run at full performance. And you can see in the front here that we actually have, here are the fans that actually blow on the CPUs. And you can see we have one channel coming in here from the front of the box and another channel coming in right here that independently cool both of those processors. So this is just an example of the kind of thinking that actually goes into making a Z840 workstation. Another example of, of the little things that make such a big difference um, I've got an example here of a, of a heat sink actually made by one of our competitors. And what you're looking at here, this is a copper heat pipe. So this is how we actually move heat from the CPU plate that actually contacts the CPU to a fan or a manifold where we actually blow the heat out. And you can see here there are air gaps in their design. And these air gaps act like insulators. They do not conduct heat. So you basically end up with a situation where you're only conducting heat in these little contact points right there and there. And that makes the design really inefficient. If you take a really close look at the, uh, at the, Z, um, the new uh, Z turbo coolers that uh, Mike brought with him, 
you'll notice that we actually fill those gaps. We solder those in, so we actually have a metallic material in there that can carry the heat very, very well. And again, it's this, this, the little things that build up together to give us the highest efficiency in cooling and really allow us to balance all those aspects of workstation design. So I've talked a little bit, or a lot, about um, you know, what we do. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do it. And uh, so, um, so I know Jeff asked earlier, but how many of you have actually been out to Fort Collins and seen the lab? So, quite a few people. Awesome. So hopefully I'm, I'm telling you something new today. Um, and for those of you that haven't been out, I definitely encourage you to come out to Fort Collins and uh, I'll personally take you through the lab tour and show you everything we've got. Until then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and, and describe the different parts of the lab. There are really three main parts of the workstation's R&D lab. So there's the, uh, the main R&D lab, which really focuses on the design of the product. You know, this is where we actually put the components on the board and design a lot of the thermal solutions that you've actually seen. Um, but I'm really going to focus today on two areas, the hardware test center and the material science lab. And these are the areas that are really part of that workstation DNA or that secret sauce, right? This is what really makes our system special. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in those particular areas. Uh, the first area, the hardware test center, this is where we do a lot of that reliability testing that you heard uh, you know, our, our customers talking about earlier, um, where we're really punishing the systems to see you know, how much margin do we really have. And this includes taking the systems way outside of their normal operating ranges to make sure that they really have a, enough margin, not just enough margin, but a considerable amount of margin on both sides. Again, this is temperature testing, electrical testing, uh, dynamics testing, the works, right? So some there are mill standard tests that we do here. And then, of course, the, there's those HP and compact designed tests that we've been doing for years and years and years. And again, to go back to my earlier story, this is where a lot of the art occurs, right? We know how to do these tests. We've been doing these things for a long, long time. Literally, some of the tests we're using are 50 plus years old and have been refined over that entire time through our experiences in HP. Just to give you some examples of what I'm talking about there, um, one, of the, one of the types of testing we do here is called shock testing. And so this is to simulate what happens to a system when you accidentally knock it over or when it's being shipped to you and the guy shipping it drops it out of the back of the truck and it hits the ground, right? We know this, these kind of things are going to happen and we want to make sure that, uh, that the system arrives not only in one piece but fully functional for its entire lifetime. Um, so we do these kind of tests, both uh, non-operating and operating, and you can see there I have a picture of one of our shock tables. Um, this table can literally simulate a 40G drop. This is like dropping a system like 10 feet onto concrete. Um, and the system has to be operational when we're doing that kind of thing. Now, I don't suggest any of you do that. <laughs> Avoid it if possible. But, like I said, we're preparing for the worst, essentially, in this kind of testing. Kind of related to shock testing is, is vibration testing, and what we're doing here is we're simulating uh, energy into the system over a longer period of time, right, at different uh, frequencies and so on. Um, and then again, we're simulating things like transportation, but we're also simulating customer environments. We know that workstation customers use our systems in some pretty unusual places, right? Um, there might be some really, really big machinery nearby that's vibrating everything around it. And small vibrations can actually have a large effect on electronic products. There are a lot of connectors in these systems, right? The places where cables actually fit into a connector. And micro vibrations over time can actually cause certain uh, connector technologies to wear out faster than they should. Um, again, we understand the physics of that. It's part of our physics of failure thinking. And we design these particular tests to look for those susceptibilities in our designs before they go out the door. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the material science lab. Uh, this is the lab that I run at HP. Um, and it's uh, basically a high-tech interactive resource for the workstation and thin client engineers at HP. Um, the cool thing about this lab is that it's not just the workstation folks. We actually have science scientists from multiple organizations that participate in the lab activities. So we have folks from the business PC group. We have folks from the quality group. Um, you know, quite an assembly of, of uh, scientific engineers in the lab. And we really focus on three things, like three main things in the lab. Uh, the first is what's called root cause analysis. And, and what, what does that actually mean? Well, uh, that means getting to the root cause of a problem. And like Jeff was saying, uh, it's kind of CSI-like activities, right? So during the development of a product, engineers may come to us and say, you know, this isn't really working the way we expected, but we just can't figure out why. 
So we'll use uh, our tools, the scientific tools we have in the lab, and the engineering tools and our expertise to help them figure out what those problems actually are and how to design solutions around those. Um, the interesting thing is, is we don't just do this during product development. So a lot of companies, the way they operate, right, you have an R&D group where they make the product, then they throw it over the wall to the supply chain and they kind of let them sell it to everybody and they move on to the next product, right? But we're different than that. We actually follow the products all the way through their entire life cycle. Um, it, like I, I literally work with HP customers myself on, <coughs> on a daily basis on uh, con you know, issues and things that are happening out in the field. And we do this in support of what we call continuous quality improvement, right? You don't know how to make your products better unless you're getting feedback. Feedback is an extremely important thing and we value it. Um, so that's what that's all about. Again, it's root cause analysis, not only during the development stage, but also after the product ships. Um, second, we do a lot of verification in the lab. Um, you know, we use world-class suppliers uh, uh, and, you know, we trust everything that they do, but we want to verify it too, right? But we're not just going to take their word for it. We're actually going to take a look at these different materials and components and make sure that, that they function the way that we want them to function. You know, the secondary benefit of doing this is you actually find the best suppliers too, right? If you start looking at them, you really see those little differences that add up in a system overall. And then lastly, we have what I call the proactive materials analysis. And this is where we're looking at future materials to see, are they appropriate for use in a workstation product? You know, as everybody knows, there are a lot of developments occurring all the time on materials. You've heard of things like liquid metal and graphene and so on. Um, well, we're looking at a lot of those futuristic materials to decide, do these belong in our products? Are they reliable? Um, do they make it faster? Do they allow us to cool it better? And so on. So let's talk a little bit uh, in more detail on the uh, root cause analysis area. I'm going to tell you a little story here. It's really kind of interesting. Um, we had a customer uh, down in Georgia. It was an art school down there. And they called us up one day and said, hey, we're, we're having some issues with your, uh, with your systems. The power supplies are just blowing up. I think that was the exact term they used. Um, obviously, we were like, OK, uh, tell us more. <laughs> and so, uh, so after talking to them for a while, um, what we discovered was is that systems around the campus, the power supplies were just suddenly shutting down and they were dead. I mean, no, no, no more functionality. Um, so, uh, so I talked to the customer myself and at one point I actually flew out to the customer site along with my manager. And this is just an, a little aside. But this, is, this is, I think, one thing that's really interesting about HP is if you as a workstation customer are having an issue, depending on what the issue is, you might actually end up talking to me, one of the engineers that actually designs the product. Now this is something that's, that's been true of HP through our entire history and it still continues today. Um, anyway, so, uh, so we flew down there and what we had discovered in the root cause FA that we had done back in the lab is that there were small particles of metal inside the power supply. And the metal was silver and copper. Um, caused us a little concern because silver and copper are used in electronic products, right? But one of the things I had noticed is that the type of silver and copper, the alloy of the metals, was not something we used. And an alloy is when we take a metal and we add just a little bit of other materials to kind of change the properties and, and give it uh, beneficial effects like strength or luster or something like that. And um, the, the alloy was, was a little bit confusing because it was actually a, a jewelry grade alloy. It wasn't something that we would actually use in an electronic product. So we went out to the school and we discovered, after doing a little bit of detective work, that all, every single one of the systems at one point or another had actually, that had failed, um, actually came from the jewelry design facility, which is kind of interesting, right? Now you could have just stopped there and said, okay, you know, it's your guy's problem, you know, it's not, we didn't do it, but we, we continued, right? So we're trying to figure out why is this happening? What, what, what are they actually doing? And we discovered that, um, that the, the students were actually grinding their jewelry. So they were actually going in there and grinding it and shaping it. And then after doing a little bit of change, they would run over to the workstations in the computer lab, which was right next door, and they would sit down and work on a CAD program and kind of change it that way. And then they'd run right back into the jewelry design area. And when they were grinding the parts, they were spraying metallic particles all over their legs. And when they went into the IT center, the workstations were on the floor right next to their legs and were pulling all of that jewelry dust in. So we worked with the customer and we had them basically move the workstations from the floor to the desk and the problem went away. So nice, easy solution, right? And just spending a little extra time to really understand what the problem was allowed us to fix it that fast. So it's an example, again, how, how we'll act as a resource 
um, not just for the R&D engineers, but for our customers out in the field as well. The, uh, the, the quality or the, the, um, the auditing part of what we do is a really, really important part, right? And it involves a lot of different aspects of looking at components. So it's looking at things like thermals, it's looking at the corrosion properties of materials. Again, we know these systems are going into uh, you know, environments that aren't necessarily like in an office or something. And so we really need to make sure that they, they can withstand the rigors of the road, so to speak. And uh, you know, we go all the way down, literally, to the molecular level, where we have the scientists um, looking at the internal structure of materials and components. As an example, there's, there's a little component on motherboards called an inductor. It's like a little magnet. And the purpose of the inductor is to filter the electricity and get rid of noise so everything runs you know, in a very stable way. Um, and we have a, uh, two magnetic experts in the lab that will actually go through and, and literally section into these parts to look at the structure of the magnetic materials to make sure that they're going to do what they should actually do. And just to give you an idea of the level that you have to go to, now, there are thousands and thousands of parts in a workstation, right? It's very difficult to look at every single one. But again, because of our experience over a long period of time, we know exactly where to look. Right? We know where the problems are and we know what to focus on. And again, that's part of the art of making a workstation. And lastly, and a really cool part of what we do is, is that proactive materials analysis, where we're going through and looking at a lot of these future materials for use in our products. Um, a really good current example of this is the, um, the Elite Book 1020 Limited Edition, which some of you might, might be familiar with. It's a super thin, really, really light notebook. And uh, there's an alloy that it uses. It's called a maglith or magnesium lithium. And it's, a, uh, it's an aerospace grade alloy that's never been used in electronic production before in any electronic products. And scientists in the materials lab helped not only develop that material into an alloy we could use, but actually work with manufacturers to get it into the electronics uh, assembly supply chain. Um, and so this is something we're really proud of because it's really an innovation in the material space um, where HP is truly leading the way. And a lot of these kind of materials, uh, like I said, these future materials are making themselves all the time into workstation products, again, to make them thinner, lighter, cooler, and so on. Um, just one quick example here, too, of, like I said, the level that we actually go to to look at different uh, materials in our products. What you're looking at here, these are connector technologies, right? So this is a connector that's actually on a graphics card. Uh, really large graphics card. As everybody knows, you know the really high-end graphics cards in our in our tower systems are quite big. Even even the graphics cards in the notebooks are, are fair, you know fairly large compared to the rest of the system. And that connector is really important. And connectors are where you have most of your most of your problems because it's a moving part, right? It's something that can go in and out. Um, there's a, there are a lot of degrees of freedom there. A lot can go wrong. So what we do is we put these through um, all the shake and shock and dynamics testing and everything else I showed you earlier, and then we go down microscopically and we actually look at the surface of the metals and look for problems like what you see here. This problem is what's called pitting. This is where we've actually worn the gold away during a shipping test and have exposed nickel underneath. Now, that, that gold's there for a reason, right? It's pretty expensive stuff. Um, you know, we would, we, nobody would use it if they didn't have to. Um, and we do because it gives us the most reliable connection. The nickel underneath, if it's exposed, it can oxidize and corrode, and that corrosion doesn't conduct electricity, and it can cause the system or the graphics card to fail really, really quickly. In fact, one of the things we've noticed is in, is in substandard designs where this actually occurs, the graphics card can fail literally after being shipped if you don't pay attention to this. Um, so what we do is we go through you know, painstaking effort to make sure that those cards are reinforced so that when they're shipped, not once, but multiple times, that they can actually get to the customer with none of this pitting occurring. We'll also look at the other side. You can see there, this is a, a connector pin that's actually in a socket. This is an electron microscope picture that actually shows right here some exposed metal on the surface where all this light material, which is the gold, is worn away. Now this is not going to be a high quality connector if it's out in the field for very long. So just to kind of give you an idea of some detail, or the, the level of detail that we actually go to, um, to ensure quality and reliability in the systems. And of course, all the products you've heard about today all went through this kind of testing and this kind of thinking. You know, the, uh, the, the new advanced cooling technologies we're developing, the Z Turbo Drive Quad Pro, and of course, you know, the ZBook Generation 3. Um, I personally spent a lot of time with all of these products, and uh, I can assure you they are very high quality products indeed. So thanks everybody for coming in. I hope you've all had a good time and uh, 
May the force be with you all. Thank <laughs> you.